Uh, Senator Jackson. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I'd be um, interested in your responses to the following concerns. Um, many of us represents dis represent districts with certain unique situations. In, in my district, we have worked for years to try to uh, reestablish uh, the condor, um, a, a endangered species, and with enormous love and attention, uh, I think that we have been somewhat successful. That being said, uh, there have been instances where uh, condors have been the target, inappropriately the target of game uh, hunters um, and others, I guess. But um, the, the, the condor is one of those creatures that is truly, um, um, I won't say beloved, but is a commitment of my area, I think out in the Ojai area where they've uh, tried to uh, protect them, uh, help the, the chicks uh, flourish. And then you have instances where there is the use of different types of ammunition. And I'm not sure, I know for years they were trying to prohibit lead Ammunition. I don't know if that's occurred. That has been signed into law. That has been signed into law. Um, but, well, that's a good thing. But, but my concern is that given that we, we all have different species and different uh, wildlife that, that exists and that we want to protect, I'm just wondering how um, relinquishing the authority, or I should say, is a local community relinquishing its authority to create perhaps stricter uh, requirements in order to protect those individual uh, interests, if you will. Um, and, and how does this bill uh, affect that? Because I, I am really not, not sure where I am on this for that very reason. And, and there are areas where we have a closer urban, rural uh, wildlife interface that may not necessarily exist in, let's say, LA or up in, uh, you know, a very rural county that I happen to have in my district, I mean, how do, how do we attend to the differences uh, in our various communities that need to be addressed and should be addressed with some of these uh, restrictions? So if you might, I'm gonna have Mark Henley, who is an expert in this field, uh, address that. And I'll point out, uh, Senator Jackson, that, uh, that uh, Bill Craven had mentioned that uh, any cities are welcome to go to the fish and game and ask for because of unique circumstances or challenges like that. And you're right with 58 counties and different urbanization patterns and the proximity to urban interface works in some areas. And in another place, you really don't want to take school field trips with gunfire going off for legitimate hunting purposes anywhere nearby. So, so the question really is who's, who's got jurisdiction over that? Yeah. So. You know, and specifically as it relates to condors, obviously those are not a hunted species, but we recognize, you know, sometimes there perhaps could be firearms involved with, uh, you know, those efforts. Um, I will say that condors actually rely on hunting as a means of food. I mean, many of the animals that are left by hunters are actually consumed by the condors, which, you know, from our perspective is gonna help with the long-term conservation of that animal. But as it relates to ordinances themselves, the bill I think is pretty clear now that if the ordinance related to the taking of fish and game directly, then that would be preempted. And then the locals in that case should go to before the Fish and Game Commission and try to have their issue solved there. But if it is a purely public safety issue, the ordinance would be valid. If I may, the ordinance would be valid as determined by fish and game or by the local jurisdiction. I'm seeing some work for lawyers here that we, God forbid, there would be, but I mean. There would be no requirement that they pass their ordinance through the Fish and Game Commission. So yes, it would be under their local control, correct. So if it's health and safety, they, the, the local community can essentially preempt fish and game by passing their own ordinances? Is if that what we're talking about? the principal purpose is health and safety, correct. May I inquire of the opposition if that's, if, if they agree or if there's some question about that or what the, what the consequences are having that approach? 
I, I don't claim to be an expert. Um, it is my understanding that uh, the ordinance that we have in place, and, and albeit it's a little bit of a reach, it's 150 yards from, uh, I believe it's a shoreline property. Um, the wardens down there, we have, and we have at some point attempted to bring this before the Fish and Game Commission, and it was, it was dismissed. Yeah, it, there, there, there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of favoritism toward these sort of buffers. Um, I think there's a patchwork of these local ordinances. This bill invalidates those lo local ordinances. Invalidates? Did that's, that's, that's our interpretation. So let's hear from the League of California Cities who's waiting here because there's different interpretations on, on this exact issue. Yeah, Madam Chair, Jason Ryan, League of California Cities. Um, Senator Jackson, uh, to your point, with regard to um, an ordinance that is, as the sponsor mentioned, primarily focused on public health and safety, we would not be preempted on this. If we are seeking to draft an ordinance to restrict a type of ammunition, under current law, we are already preempted. The Constitution is clear in that it has delegated the power of regulating a fishing game to the legislature. The legislature has then delegated that power to the Fishing Game Commission. So we currently would not have that authority. Um, in all fairness, I mean, there may be ordinances out there that, that are currently invalid. Um, maybe not knowing that the Constitution has already, you know, preempted us. Um, but that scenario with ammunition or seasons or bag limits or any of that, we currently are preempted, and this bill would not change that in any way. That's always been the historic case, though, on fish and games jurisdiction. Right. So specifically, Senator Jackson, like a, can a city, what can they do to protect the health and safety? Right. You know, the example that, that uh, Mr. Houston brought up, I mean, you know, not knowing the exact specifics of the case, but Trails. I think our attorneys would argue that we currently can do that. And that if we can show that our ordinance, the buffer zone that we are creating is to, in fact, protect public health and safety, um, that it, it is not having a negative impact on hunting because somebody could still discharge that firearm 151 yards away um, from there. And you're not banning hunting. You're merely setting up a public safety zone around that. So, you know, again, not knowing the specifics, I think we would argue that we could do that and this bill would not preempt uh, public trails with lots exactly. of people using them you could exactly that that's our interpretation specify so that area that's the case uh, my colleague next to me and I are having this discussion but if you wouldn't mind my asking the question then if we already have that authority what's the purpose of this bill right there are lo local jurisdictions that are actually uh, enforcing um, uh, ordinances that preempt fish and game control. And so we're saying that in navigable waters um, and in lands that aren't privately owned, that the fish and game has the jurisdiction and the wardens for enforcement. And simply that. We're just trying to clarify the law that is actually still there, but um, there is no preemptive uh, purpose to take away health and safety. We're all, uh, recognizing that. And so, go ahead. In, in the case of the East Bay Regional Parks, that is a navigable water area. And, you know, the part of the legal information that we provided to the committee, hunting is considered a right of navigable waters, incidental to the right of navigation. And so that's where you get into tricky issues because there's a public trust easement over those waters that allows for hunting. So any attempt then to regulate hunting on those waters themselves, not up on the levees or any on, on the land side, that has to either go through the Fish and Game Commission or the State Lands Commission. I, I would suggest as times change, you know, and urbanization changes, a separate bill looking at that issue in certain counties with certain populations on navigable waters. That's not in this. I, I take the author at his word, his primary purpose of the bill is to reaffirm the state's sole regulatory authority over taking possession of fish and game by prohibiting cities and counties from passing ordinances that strictly relate to taking or possession of fish and game. It's sort of clarifying what is in statute, that that's the role of fish and game, and the other is the role of local governments and public safety. But I think over time, I think this is going to have to be revisited as we're having this urban clash of... And if I may, of one of the examples... That hunting in areas where people are recreating. That's the challenge. 
if I may add, one of the examples that was listed in the analysis is an ordinance that specifically regulates hunting, purposely regulates hunting in certain areas of San Francisco Bay. And that is just flatly unconstitutional, but it still is on the books to this day. And my assumption is the, the local okay, locals but, enforce but it. It couldn't, if I may, if, couldn't you argue that regulating hunting is a matter of public health and safety? Yes, and that is done. So why is it unconstitutional if a local jurisdiction has an ordinance that specifically uh, defines, confines uh, uh, the, uh, the area where one can hunt? Because it goes back to the Supreme Court case, um, and that says basically, I'll use the, the term or the phrase that cities and counties after the initiative was passed back in the 1910s or 20s, took away the power of locals to regulate on the subject of fishing game in any way. And so that we're relying on that Supreme Court case. I, I understand, but you've said that cities are not preempted in ordinances that are designed for health and safety. But if one argues, I, I'm not, I don't know anything about the specifics, but that you don't want hunting going on in areas that have now become more urbanized for the health and safety or for the safety, of the public, why should that then be an invalid, I mean, under your legislation, then that is invalidated or not? I, I, I'm looking- It really goes to the intent. If the intent is public safety and to right. regulate merely the discharge of firearms, that is allowed by the locals. If the intent is to regulate hunting, that is a state issue and therefore needs to go before the Fish and Game Commission. So who is going to decide this? I, let's say I'm a community and I pass something because I truly believe it's a question of safety, but, but another, uh, but the, the hunting organization says, no, that's not what you're doing at all. Do you end up in litigation over that to determine whether or not the, the ordinance is valid? To my knowledge, very few of these have actually been litigated. Our group is certainly not uh, a litigious organization. Um, what we're trying to do, I think, with the bill is in those instances where it's clear that someone's trying to regulate hunting purposely, that they go through the Fish and Game Commission, and that's the appropriate venue for that discussion. So someone makes that decision and then brings it to Fish and Game. Or, okay, thank you. All right, final comments. All right, any other questions by members? Uh, Senator Wilk had made a motion. Um, Senator Member Fraser, if you'd like to close. Just really appreciate the, the dialogue and uh, look forward to your I vote. I'm going to ask you to do something though before it goes to appropriations there. Uh, uh, Bill Craven had commented he just didn't even see amendments himself till Friday. That's correct. If they hadn't been written. I'd like you to look and consider those and have responses for them, you know, when it, before it comes to appropriations. There may be some um, relevance or something you can do to address some of those issues, whether it's a buffer or the wetlands, what you, you heard for the first time. Yeah. So it's a little late for our committee to represent them, but before it becomes a bigger issue than it should be on the floor, maybe you, you'll have time to address them. And understand and willingly look for a dialogue on that matter. Uh, we have talked about signage and, and different uh, opportunities for that. And knowing that East Bay Parks is a big part of my district, I do know all the board of directors and, and they haven't contacted me, but uh, we'll look forward for their input also. I just think over time, eventually, some of these issues will be challenged with the huge expense of population at 39 million people in some areas in some counties where maybe this doesn't work anymore. But um, for today, I'm supporting it, but would like you to meet with the appropriate people and include my staff. You know, I also possibility of additional amendments, and I and I willing will so will do so. But I also liken it to urban sprawl on farming, where we have to, as a condition of approval, tell the people that are moving into the areas that there's pesticide spraying and odd hours worked and stuff like that. So there is urban sprawl in every part of our our society, and so we are adjusting to those things. But and we the, do disclose that yeah. moving and the forward. Impacts. All right, the motion is due pass as amended to appropriations. Senators Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Stone. Aye. Stone, aye. Allen. Hertzberg. Aye. Hertzberg, aye. 
Queso, Jackson, Monning, Vidak, aye. Vidak, aye, Wolk. That's four. Okay, you have four votes. It's on call. Let's go on to file item 17. Thank you, people Thank you very who much. testified. Um, this one should be easier. Marine debris removal and disposal of stool referred to judiciary, Senator Jackson. So file item 17. We're going to have to go to caucus, I think. Did you want to after this bill or do you want to break it now? Well, we should hear him. Hello? Hello? Sal, I'm out. Patty, I do have someone confirm that we indeed have a caucus today. And what time they're starting, whatever the presentation is. Okay, let us go on to file item 17, Assembly Bill 1323 on marine debris, removal and disposal. Go ahead and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. AB 1323 creates an expedited process for agencies to remove marine debris, which is defined as a vessel or part of a vessel that is unseaworthy and not reasonably fit as a means of transportation by water. The purpose of this bill is to deal with derelicts, wrecks, hulks, and parts of ships that are no longer truly vessels and pollute our state waterways. Although current law provides the authority for a sheriff to deal with wrecked property and abandoned vessels, the current required procedures are both time consuming and very costly. Because this process is so impractical and costly, it, it is seldom used and as a result, broken or disintegrated vessels and parts of them remain and continue to pollute our waterways and the environment. Testifying, I have a plethora of experts today uh, uh, from the State Lands Commission, recreational boaters, and, and so on for here to provide technical assistance. And I thank you and uh, respect that. And I would note there's no opposition to this bill that I have uh, noted here. And so um, if you keep comments brief, I wanna let members know we're only going to go a few more minutes, probably 12, 15, and then take a break for caucus. And we'll return to room 112, 113 at 130. Senator Allen, we're not going to be able to finish, so at about 12.15, we're going to break and go to caucus and return at 1.30 to room 113 to finish this agenda. But let's, so uh, brevity is helpful. Uh, Madam Chair, members, Bill Krauss, representing the National Marine Manufacturers Association, the Marina Recreation Association, the California Association of Harbor Masters and Port Captains, the California Yacht Brokers Association, and the Worldwide Boaters Safety Group. Um, uh, there's no opposition, I'll just make two quick points. One is um, to put this issue in context. Cars have a built-in system for get ri getting rid of vehicles with the, when they're at the end of their useful life. Boats don't, there's millions of boats, and so you can imagine where some of these end up. Um, and so this is, we need an expedited process to get rid of this, and I'll, my final point, which is, this is in fact marine debris. I was glad to see this in the legislation. These things are barely vessels. Uh, it's, a, it's a stretch to call it a vessel. Um, because it is debris and that's what they become. Um, the analysis does a good job of talking about sort of the process of how these things get sort of this underground economy that puts these things into the, into the weeds uh, on our waterways. And so this is a good bill and it's a, really about getting rid of junk and not about processing vessels. And so we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Second witness. Good morning, uh, uh, Madam Chair, members. Thank you and thank uh, Assemblymember Frazier for bringing this bill forward. My name is Greg Giveson. I'm president of Recreational Boaters of California. Uh, we represent about 80,000 boating families throughout the state, the responsible boaters I'd like to think. Um, and uh, we hardly support this bill. Uh, uh, being a boat owner, uh, believe me, those of us that are on the water, we're the true stewards. We want that water safe, we want it clean. Between the public safety issue of hitting something submerged and the environmental issues of the gas, the uh, fluids, the uh, uh, sanitation and so forth, this is a wonderful bill as uh, has been described and we urge your eye vote. Yep, I see no problems with it. Okay, any other? People here wishing to lend on their name in support. I know you were here for answering primarily questions if there were any, but if you wanted to add your name or a brief comment. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Peter Pelkofer. I'm a maritime attorney. I did the original draft of the bill, and I'm basically here to respond to questions if you If have. there's questions. All right. Anyone else wishing to add their name in support of this measure? Any opposition to this bill? I know none formally on file. I'd be happy to move the bill, and uh, the bill will be coming to judiciary, and we'll deal with those uh, more judiciary-related uh, bills. But I thank you for bringing it, and I'll move okay. the bill. There has been a motion. Senator Stone, you had a question? I was going to move the bill. Oh. I want to thank the uh, assemblyman for bringing it forward. Very good. Thank you. Would you like to close the assemblyman for you? Respectfully ask for your eye vote. All right. The motion is due pass to judiciary. Roll call. Senator Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Allen? Aye. Allen, aye. Hertzberg? Hueso? Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Monning? Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Wolk? Very good. You have enough votes. We're going to leave it open for missing members. So we have time for Assemblymember Salas. And then... Um, I'll be quick, yeah. Madam Chair. Uh, Assemblymember Garcia, we're going to take you up after lunch. After caucus. And Assemblymember Lopez will be uh, paid, uh, excuse me, room 113 at 130, as well as Assemblymember Lopez this will be, will be breaking for caucus. We'll hear this one last bill. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Should I begin? Let's just wait one minute. And while we're waiting for the room to clear, let's open the roll for those uh, members that are here that haven't voted. Okay, file item number one, AB 96. The current vote is five to one. Senator Stone? No. Stone, no. Hertzberg? Hueso? Okay. It was back on call for five to two. Um, Consent calendar, no. we have everyone? No? Yeah. File item number four, AB 300. Current vote is 6 0. Senator Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Hueso? Walk. Okay, 7 0. Goes back on call. File item number five, AB 392. The current vote is five to zero. Senator Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Hertzberg? Hueso? Walk. That goes back on call, six to zero. File item number eight, AB 549. Current vote is six to zero. Senator Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Hueso? Monning. That's seven to zero. Back on call. Uh, I got that one just now. Okay, file item number 18, AB 1390. The current vote is 6 0. Senator Stone? Yes. Stone, I. Allen? Hueso? Okay, that's back on call, 7 to 0. And that must be it. Oh, one more. File item number 22, AB 1528. Current vote is 5 to 1. Senator Stone? Stone, no. Hueso? Monning? So that's f back on call, five to two. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Some member Salas, file item 19, AB 1420, oil and gas pipelines. My understanding is you're accepting the committee amendments. We understand you're still working on this bill. Absolutely. absolutely. And my staff appreciates that and looks forward to continuing the discussion. But because you would be out of time, we want to be able to allow this bill to move forward to have that discussion. Thank you. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. Okay. So let's begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senators, I present before you Assembly Bill 1420. It uh, absolutely deals with a district matter out in the city of Arvin where there was a gas pipeline leak. Um, talking to some of the residents out there, there was a lot of confusion about, one, who had jurisdiction, two, uh, what they needed to do, and, and thirdly, when they could go back into their homes. Assembly Bill 1420 attempts to address some of these issues as outlined in the analysis. And thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for, for uh, specifying the amendments. And thank you to your staff for all their work that they've done on this. Uh, we are moving forward. And with that, I do have some folks here to testify and support. We are really trying to resolve what happened out there in the city of Arvin and, you know, other communities like it. So thank you. All right. Let's hear from your witnesses. 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Committee. My name is Cesar Campos. I'm the Director of Central California Environmental Justice Network. My organization works for environmental justice across the San Joaquin Valley uh, with a specific focus in Fresno and Kern counties. In Kern, we host the Kern Environmental Enforcement Network, which is a resident reporting network on environmental hazards. Uh, this project allows residents to report any environmental concern or anything that they feel is threatening to their health. In March of last year, we received one of these calls from a resident in Arvin. Uh, the resident mentioned that there was a strong smell of petroleum inside her home. My colleague in Kern County rushed to the scene with an air sam sampling bucket. Shortly after that, another colleague in Kern County called us about a news story that was developing in Arvin. People are being evacuated from their houses, something about a gas pipeline that leaked, she said. We quickly, re we quickly realized that it was the same story. My colleague Gustavo arrived at the scene, took an air sample, and stayed with the families of eight houses until they were all evacuated from their homes. Uh, there was about a nine hour time lapse between the initial call and when the residents were all out of their houses. Since this was in the middle of the week, many residents were either at work or at school and came home to find out that they could not sleep in their homes that night. In fact, they would not be able to sleep in their homes for the next nine months. After the evacuation, what followed was a frenzy from jurisdictional agencies fumbling with the responsibilities for cleanup oversight. The Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources did not even show up until about six months after the evacuation, claiming that this pipeline was not within their jurisdiction. It wasn't until our organizations drafted several letters directly to the governor and released a video to all major media outlets uh, that the division actually showed up. By then, the residents were already incredibly frustrated with the process and had already lost trust in the regulatory agencies that were supposed to protect them. During the final meeting uh, that the division hosted in December, right before the residents were given two days to move back to their homes, the residents kept asking for a signed certificate that would assure them that they would be safe returning to their homes. They didn't get that. In fact, since December, many residents have informed us that their symptoms, things like bleeding noses and headaches, have actually returned uh, since being back at their homes. This doesn't surprise us, given that just two weeks after the residents returned, our organizations went to the location with an infrared camera and observed VOC emissions from a nearby tank field owned by the same company. This observation yielded a notice of violation from the area district. I'm telling you all of this and this experience because I want to let you know that this incident is far from over uh, and because you have in front of you a piece of legislation that can prevent future events like this from happening, uh, I hope that you vote aye on this. Thank you. Uh, next witness. Madam Chair, I'm going to move approval. There's been a motion by Senator Stone. Second witness. Uh, good morning. You're good. Uh, good morning. My name is Ingrid Brostrom. I'm an attorney with the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. We work with Central Valley residents to uh, protect their environmental health and to reduce their exposure to pollution. Um, and I uh, appreciate the short opportunity to express CRP support for AB uh, 1420. Uh, gas lines across the state um, uh, sit below the ground surface and are undetectable to residents who live near them. These residents depend upon the state to protect them from any potential hazards from these pipes. However, under, under existing law, the state simply has no way of knowing where these smaller pipelines are. They have no way of knowing the risks they pose, and they have no way of knowing whether these pipelines are mechanically sound. Even in the cases where state has records for these small pipelines, there is no legal requirement for any agency to check these pipelines for leaks. Because of these failures, three dozen people in Arvin, California were exposed to explosive levels of gas in their homes for up to a year and a half. We do not yet know the long-term health impacts this accident will have on these families, but we do know that we must prevent this type of tragedy from happening again. AB 1420 requires the state to identify smaller pipelines near residences and schools and requires that these pipelines are checked for leaks every two years. Any one of these pipelines could be a ticking, ticking time bomb. We need to protect residents in the Central Valley and around the state from easily preventable gas leaks. For these reasons, I ask for your support for AB 1420 today. Thank you. Okay, it sounds like a little bit about <laughs> who knows where the pipelines are, notification, and a variety of other issues. Sounds like a tragedy and a lot of potential health impacts to local residents. So thank you for bringing that, this to our attention. There has been a motion. Let's see if there are other people wish to lend their name and affiliation in support of this measure. Kyle Jones of Sierra Club, California in support. Thank you. Anyone else? Opposition, I notice uh, we'd like to tell the members this bill has been double referred to environmental quality, allowing time for the author as well as my staff and EQ staff to work on any final resolution on amendments. 
Senator Stone, any comments from anyone here? Uh, Senator Vidak? Thank you, Mr. Solis. Um, full support of this, and I'd like to be added a co-author. Love to add you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Is that in your district, too? I drove through yesterday. Exeter, Porterville, Lindsay. Saw Arvin exit on the 99 going through Bakersfield. All right. Next time you have to stop by, we'll have to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the motion is uh, do pass as amended to environmental quality. Senators Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Stone. Aye. Stone, aye. Allen. Allen, aye. Hertzberg. Hueso. Jackson. Monning. Vidak. Vidak, aye. Wolk. There's four votes. So you have four votes. We'll leave it on call. Thank you very much. Thank you both for attending. So now just see Thank you, Senator. Will be on recess yeah. until 1.30 in one And I would like to officially notice that we'll be in recess. That's the Committee of Natural Resources and Water. We'll be rejoining or re <laughs> reconvening uh, in room 113 at 1.30. Thank you.